Mighty fortress where we will be sheltered from the storm. Mighty fortress is our God.
Our Father, which art in heaven, we are so thankful for the privilege and the opportunity to be here this morning. We are thankful that your presence is among us, but more than that, we are thankful that your presence abide in us. We pray that everything that happens here this morning will approach the beauty of holiness and will bring honor and glory to your name. Speak to and speak through your manservant, for we pray it in Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, certainly happy to see you this morning, and I would like to uh, encourage you. By the way, that was Leroy Green. He's our new pastor in Plainview and Tulia and a couple of Spanish churches there, I believe in Lubbock. Where's the other one, Leroy? Olton. Olton, okay. That he's there. Now, by the way, you know, my soul's really been watered as I've come and heard Marvin Moore. And... Uh, those of you that know him, there's, there's something about him that he comes through. He's the editor of the Signs of the Times. And I must say this, I heard him speak about sending the signs out last night. You know, back several years ago, we have our relatives, my wife and I are looking at it, anyways, thinking, what should we do? I want them to be in the heaven. So we decided, I don't know, it's about 25 signs that we send out each year. I want every family to know of this message. And we have some, and I don't know whether they throw them in the trash or not. When they do, sometimes they reject them, so we send it someplace else. But you know something? I feel every month there's something going in there from the Lord. And I just thought that was a good covenant to make and to send that. Anyway, I'd like to say I'm certainly glad to hear Elder Moore. And so we'll just turn the time over to him at this time. Well, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate that good promotion for Signs of the Times. You can say that anytime you want to. Now, this morning, our topic is about the close of probation. Uh, next to the investigative judgment, I would say that the close of probation is one of the scariest doctrines that Adventists have uh, ever taught. Unfortunately, it doesn't have to be scary. I mean, fortunately, it doesn't have to be scary, but unfortunately, many people are terrified of the close of probation. Now, what do we mean by probation? Well, in ordinary legal terms, probation means the time that a prisoner is given to demonstrate to the world that he will be safe to live on the outside, and he meets every month with his probation officer and uh, takes certain classes, and. Um, after a period of time, he's released from his probation and he's free to live wherever he wants to. He's a free person. In theological terms, probation is the, period, is, the time, is the time that God has given human beings to accept Jesus, to uh, develop their characters. Probation in theological terms began when God pronounced on Adam and Eve that he would... Uh, send the, there would be enmity between Satan and the woman, the church, and uh, ever since then, human beings throughout most of their lives, throughout all their lives, most human beings throughout all their lives have had the opportunity to accept Jesus or reject him. We still have that opportunity. In theological terms, the close of probation is the time when that opportunity will no longer exist. Now, most Christians, if you ask them, would say, well, probation will close at Christ's second coming. And there are some texts that might suggest that. Uh, I'm thinking especially of Jesus' parables of the wheat and the tares and the sheep and the goats. You'll recall in the parable of the sheep and the goats, uh, it says that when the Son of Man comes in his kingdom, he will set the goats on his right hand, the sheep on his right hand, and the goats on his left. There will be a separation between the two groups. And it would appear that probation will close at that time. Adventists are a little bit unique in this uh, I, matter of the close of probation. We believe that probation will close a short time before the second coming of Christ. Now, I used to think that uh, 
the only basis for that teaching was Ellen White. But I also was aware that our basic teachings need to arise from scripture, so I went in search of evidence that probation will close before the second coming of Christ. And I would like to share with you the results of my uh, research. Uh, turn to Revelation chapter 15. And while you're turning, I will remind you of something. Revelation divides the end time, God's end time, the, the, divides the world into two groups, just like the parable of the wheat and the tares and the parable of the, of the sheep and the goats. In Revelation, it's those who receive the seal of God and those who receive the mark of the beast. We give them different symbols, but it's the same two groups. Now, let's look at Revelation chapter 15 and verse 1. I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with seven last plagues, last because with them God's wrath is completed. So the, se the seven last plagues are about to be poured out. The angels emerge who are going to do that. Now let's skip down to verses 5 through 8. After this I looked, and in heaven the temple, that is the tabernacle of the testimony, was opened. Well now the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven is the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary and uh, John says that he saw that apartment opened. There was a time in the earthly sanctuary when you could say that the most holy place was opened. When was that? Well, it was the time of Jesus' death when the veil was rent in two from top to bottom, exposing the most holy place. Now the significance of that is that ministry in that sanctuary ceased. Well, I guess you could say that it didn't cease because for the next 40 years, the priests continued to offer their sacrifices, but they were meaningless. Uh, so we could say then that at the time of Christ's death, the services in the earthly sanctuary ceased to be effective. Now when the, when the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary is opened, then I think that means ministry in that sanctuary has ceased. Let's keep going. Out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues. They were dressed in clean shining linen and wore golden sashes around their chests. I believe that's priestly attire. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. So, I mean, the, the seven last plagues are just about to be poured out. Now look at verse 8. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. That is a very significant text. Revelation, as I'm sure you are aware, draws many of its symbols out of the Old Testament. And in verse 8, we see one of the symbols that's drawn from the Old Testament. So please turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 5 and verses 13 and 14. And while you're turning, I will mention to you that this section of Chronicles describes the dedication of Solomon's temple. So what we're going to read here is occurring at the dedication of Solomon's temple. Verses 13 and 14 of First, Second Chronicles 5. The trumpeters and singers joined in unison as with one voice to give praise and thanks to the Lord. Accompanied by trumpets, cymbals, and other instruments, they raised their voices in praise to the Lord and sang, he is good, his love endures forever. Then the temple of the Lord was filled with the cloud and the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the temple of God. Do you see the similarity with Revelation 15 verse eight? Let's go over to chapter seven now, verses one and two, and we will see the same thing. 
2 uh, Chronicles 7, 1 and 2. When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priests could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. So over here in Revelation 15 now, verse 8, we see a similar situation. The angels with the seven last plagues appear. They're given the seven golden bowls to pour out the seven last plagues. And it says the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Uh, I propose that one of the ones who cannot enter the, enter the temple until the seven angels are complete, until the um, seven last plagues are completed, is Jesus Christ himself. His mediatorial ministry has ended. In Chronicles it said, not only that the priests couldn't enter the temple, it said they couldn't carry out their ministry. Christ will not be carrying out his ministry after these, uh, after this smoke and glory of God fills the temple. Now let's look at chapter 16, verse 1, verses 1 and 2. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the land, and ugly and painful sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. Well, apparently the two groups have already been divided, separated. At least God knows who they are, because the first plague, and all the plagues actually, are poured out on those who have the mark of the beast. So it has to be determined at that point who has the mark of the beast and who does not. And so therefore, uh, I, I think this is another evidence that probation has closed before the second coming of Christ because Christ comes at the end of the seven plagues. In fact, the, the seventh plague, I believe, is the second coming of Christ or is at least immediately before it. So we don't know how long the seven last plagues will last. Adventists have traditionally said that they will last one year. I'm not sure that that's necessarily the case. They may only last a few weeks. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see what happens. That doesn't matter. Ellen White was very clear about the close of probation occurring before the second coming of Christ. When the, she, this is a great controversy, 613 and 614. When the third angel's message closes, mercy no longer pleads for the guilty inhabitants of the race of the earth. Jesus ceases his intercession in the sanctuary above. He lifts his hands and with a loud voice he says, it is done. And all the angelic hosts lay off their crowns as he makes a solemn announce announcement. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. Every case has been decided for life or death. Probation has closed. And then Ellen White says, when... Jesus leaves the sanctuary. This is great controversy 614. When Jesus leaves the sanctuary, the righteous must live in the sight of a holy God without an intercessor. Whoa. And uh, all kinds of strange ideas, theological ideas, have arisen among Adventists because of this concept. Scary ideas. And I think some rather unbalanced ideas. Well, I think the first question we need to address is what will it mean to live without a mediator? And the best way I can think of to answer that question is to ask what does it mean to live with a mediator today? In other words, what is Jesus doing for us right now? And then ask, will these benefits be available to us after the close of probation? So let's go through. I have a list of seven things, and I'm sure that's a very short list. If we were to ask Jesus, he'd probably mention dozens of things and maybe hundreds of things that he's doing, benefits we receive as a result of his mediatorial ministry. But I'm going to share with you seven, 
And then we're going to ask after each one, will this be available to God's people after the close of probation? Okay, number one, what Jesus is doing right now in heaven, he is influencing those who are not his people to surrender their lives to him. Will that opportunity be available after the close of probation? No. But do we need to worry about that? If we are his people before the close of probation, then we will be his people after the close of probation. The ones that need to be worried about the, after the close of probation, no one will be giving their lives to Jesus for the first time. The ones that need to worry about that are the wicked. So you can relax about the fact that Jesus will not, no longer be converting people after the close of probation as long as you're converted before probation closes. Then here's another one, what Jesus is doing for us. Indwelling the minds and hearts of his people. I've had over the past number of years, as I give seminars on the end time and righteousness by faith, those are to my two favorite topics to talk about and write about. As I've given these seminars over the years, I've had uh, several times people have come up to me and have said, Pastor Moore, will we have the Holy Spirit after the close of probation? You know, as though somehow we've got to be good enough before the close of probation, we've got to learn how to be good enough so that we can live without the Holy Spirit after the close of probation. My goodness, uh, human beings have never been able to live a good life without the presence of the Holy Spirit. It would be impossible to live a good life after the close of probation without the Holy Spirit. Who is it that will lose the Holy Spirit after the close of probation? Ellen White says, when Jesus leaves the sanctuary, darkness covers the inhabitants of the earth. In that fearful time, the righteous must live in the sight of a holy God without an intercessor. The restraint which is, has been upon the wicked is removed and Satan has entire control of the finally impenitent. The world has rejected his mercy, despised his love, and trampled his law. The wicked have passed the boundary of their probation. The Spirit of God, persistently resisted, has at last been withdrawn. Who loses the Holy Spirit after the close of probation? The wicked, not the righteous. So right now, part of Jesus' meditorial work is to send us the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, when I, when I go back to the Father, I will pray the Father, and he will send you the Holy Spirit. The Comforter. Well now, when Jesus talking to God is mediatorial ministry. Talking to God about us and asking us to re, uh, him to send us the Holy Spirit, that's mediatorial ministry. And that will continue after the close of probations, Jesus sending us the Holy Spirit as much as before. Now here's another one. What Jesus is doing for us right now in heaven as our mediator. He's forgiving us of our sins. So the big question is this, will forgiveness of sin be available after the close of probation? How many would say yes? Let me see your hands. Okay. See a couple of hands. How many would say no? Let me see your hands if you would say no. Okay. And then how many are undecided? Let's see your hands. <laughs> All right. Well, let me give you my response to that. I would say this, if we need forgiveness after the close of probation, it will be available. Now the issue is whether we'll need it. Let me read to you a comment, a statement by Ellen White, Great Controversy 621. This statement, is, this paragraph is in the chapter on the time of trouble. And that entire chapter is after the close of probation. Great Controversy 621, God's love for his children during the period of their severest trial is as strong and tender as in the days of their sunniest prosperity, but it is needful for them to be placed in the furnace of fire. Their earthliness must be consumed that the image of Christ may be perfectly reflected. Their earthliness must be consumed. After the close of probation, there is still some kind of earthliness in God's people that must, that must be consumed. Now, those who insist that God's people will be absolutely sinlessly perfect after the close of probation, uh, the response I've heard from them is, well, earthliness is not sinfulness. Well, I decided to uh, 
check that out. So I went onto the CD-ROM, typed in the word earthliness, and uh, the E.G. White CD-ROM, Bill, you know about that. You uh, worked with that. Uh, Bill Fagel, by the way, who's with us this morning, is one of the associate directors of the White Estate. So he knows all about Ellen White's CD-ROM. And here's what I found when I checked out the word earthliness. The Lord permits trials in order that we may be cleansed from earthliness, from selfish, from harsh, unchristlike traits of character. Does that sound like earthliness equals sinfulness? I think so. That was from Car Subject Lessons 174. And then from Christian Temperance and Bible Hygiene 147, a book that is no longer in print, look at the condition of the men who give themselves up to intemperance, littleness, earthliness, degradation. Mark their entire character. This is a result of their evil course. Does that sound like earthliness equals sinfulness? At least sinfulness of character. So I propose that after the close of probation, there will be, God's people will still have some imperfections in their characters that have to be cleansed out. Now here's what I propose. I think after the close of probation, God's people will not willingly choose to do knowingly choose to do something wrong, commit a sin. I, th I think that we will have reached that level of character development. But, you know, if we still have some, some uh, character defects that need to be cleansed, then I think it's possible that uh, if Jesus would, were down here, he might say, you know, son or daughter, um, I wouldn't advise you to do that. We will not necessarily be aware that we're doing something that he would advise us not to do because I think that we probably will not knowingly do uh, a wrong act but it may you know we'll still have some imperfect characters imperfections and sin arises from our character imperfections so in the matter of forgiveness of sin I believe it will be available if we need it now then, another thing that Jesus is doing for us right now as our mediator is covering us with the robe of his righteousness. Well, will he continue to cover us with the robe of his righteousness after the close of probation? Yes, of course. Another thing he's doing is giving us the power to overcome sin. Will that be available after the close of probation? Yes. And uh, finally, well, no, one more thing, two more things that Jesus will... Uh, is doing right now, he's responding to our prayers. That's part of his work as our, as our mediator. Will he be doing that after the close of probation? Yes. And finally, uh, right now, Jesus is defending us against Satan's accusations. Will he be doing that after the close of probation? Yes. Please note, every, uh, of the seven things I've mentioned, six will be available to God's people after the close of probation. So what is this about no mediator in the heavenly sanctuary? Well, here's my response to that. It's true, Jesus will have ceased his role as our mediator. So there will be no mediator in the heavenly sanctuary after the close of probation. Jesus will have taken on a new role at that point. Uh, the, at the end of the investigative judgment, Daniel tells us this in Daniel 7, that Jesus has given dominion over the earth. He is now made the king of the earth, and therefore, after the close of probation, Jesus will be, instead of being our mediator, he will be our king. And everything that we need after the close of probation that we are receiving before the close of probation, Jesus will be giving to us in his new role as our king. He will not be our mediator, but he will be our king, and he'll be doing, giving us everything we need. So please forget about this business of scared to death about living without a mediator, because Jesus is still going to be doing everything for you that you need. Okay? Yes. I hope that comes as a relief to some of you who have been scared to death of the close of probation. Now, there's another issue that we have to deal with, and that is end time perfection. There are those who insist that we have to be absolutely, sinlessly perfect in order to live after the close of probation, and so then they make every possible effort to become sinless, and many times they become very fanatical and legalistic, and they insist that everybody else in the church has to live exactly according to their ideas about nutrition and about Sabbath keeping and about all of the various standards of the Adventist church. And what they're really doing is uh, uh, going on a righteousness by works kick.
That's what they're doing, trying to get perfect. Well, there are three kinds of perfection that are mentioned in the Bible. One is sinless perfection. Let me share with you a couple of statements from Ellen White. Those who are living upon the earth when the intercession of Christ shall cease in the sanctuary above are to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Their robes must be spotless, their characters must be purified from sin by the blood of sprinkling. Through the grace of Christ and their own diligent effort, they must be conquerors in the battle with evil. While the investigative judgment is going forward in heaven, while the sins of penitent believers are being removed from the sanctuary, there is to be a special work of purification of putting away of sin among God's people upon earth. That's from Great Controversy 425. And then from page 623, now while our great high priest is making the atonement for us, we should seek to become perfect in Christ. Not even by thought could our Savior be brought to yield to the power of temptation. Satan finds in human hearts some point where he can gain a foothold, some sinful desire is cherished by means of which his temptations assert their power. But Christ declared of himself, the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. Satan could find nothing in the Son of God would, that would enable him to gain the victory. He had kept his father's commandments and there was no sin in him that Satan could use to his advantage. Now these ominous words, this is the condition in which those must be found who shall stand in the time of trouble. So this matter of sinless perfection after the close of probation does have some basis of uh, reality in Ellen White's statements. But I think we need to again put that in, into perspective, which I'm going to be doing in the rest of this presentation. Uh, let's talk about three kinds of perfection that the Bible mentions, okay? Number one is sinless perfection, which we've just talked about. There was no sin in Jesus Christ that Satan could use to his advantage. This is the condition in which those must be found who shall stand in the time of trouble. In other words, uh, we've overcome all sin. There is no sin in us. Sinless. There's been quite a bit of fanaticism arise out of that idea. Um, but nevertheless, it does have some basis in Ellen White's writings. Another kind of uh, perfection that the Bible talks about is Christian maturity. Uh, what I'm going to read to you next is two, two different ways of translating the same passages in, uh, from the Greek. Uh, Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14. I'm not going to read the whole passage. I'm just going to read one sentence. Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. Now, that's from the King James Version. The NIV translates this, all of us who are mature should take such a view of things. I think that's probably a better translation because I think everybody would agree that at, at Paul's time, uh, sinless perfection was not a condition that most people in the church had. So when Paul says, let us therefore as many as be perfect, he's talking about to the Christians in, in Philippi. He means as many of us as are mature Christians. I think the NIV is correct. Then the King James Version from Ephesians 4, 11 to 13. Again, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but Paul says, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. The NIV says, until we all become mature. And again, I think the NIV is more correct because perfect has the idea of sinlessness, whereas uh, I don't think the God's people back then, all of, us, all of them were sinless, and therefore I think mature is a better translation. And I think it's a, a, a good way to understand the idea of Christian perfection as maturity, Christian maturity. And I will say this, folks, those who pass through the time of trouble after the close of probation, are going to have to have very mature characters in order to stand through that difficult time. This will not be a time for spiritual infants and spiritual weaklings. And then there's a third kind of perfection that we as Christians talk about, and that is the robe of Christ's righteousness. There's a step, there's a, a one sentence in Steps to Christ that defines this perfectly. Ellen White says, Christ's character stands in place of your character and you are accepted before God just as if you had not sinned. 
And the context of this is Christ's forgiveness of our sins, uh, justification. Uh, that's the context of this statement. And she says, Christ's character stands in place of your character, and you are accepted by God just as if you had not sinned. Now, to be accepted by God just as if you had not sinned is to be counted by God as though you were perfect. So, sometimes I say to an audience, would everybody here in the audience today who is perfect please raise your hand, and uh, one or two timid hands will kind of scoot up, you know. And so then I say, now everybody raise their hand. So let's do that right now, please. Everybody raise one hand, two if you wish, and now I'm looking at all the perfect people here in this audience this morning. Not because you are perfect within yourself, but because you're covered with the robe of Christ's righteousness, and Jesus, God, counts you as sinless through Christ's robe of righteousness covering you. Now, I propose to you that that certainly will be a characteristic of God's people after the close of probation. We will have the robe of Christ's righteousness covering us. So then the issue is, what about sinlessness, which Ellen White does seem to suggest will be a characteristic of God's people after the close of probation? Well, first thing I want to do is turn your, atten your attention to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8, and the apostle says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we claim to be without sin, those people who are trying to work toward perfection so they can be sinless after the close of probation will never be able to claim it. Because if you claim to be without sin, that's one of the best evidences that you are still a sinner. Let me share with you an analogy. The analogy of happiness. Happiness does not come by striving for it. The people who strive for happiness are among some of the most unhappy people in the world because they are looking for happiness in all the wrong places. They are looking at alcohol and drugs and loose and fast living and they become some of the most miserable people in the world. They are searching for happiness you know, happiness comes not by searching for it and trying to find it. Happiness comes by doing the things that lead to happiness and forget about being happy. Just do the things that lead to happiness. Service to others. Stay, ma maintaining a close relationship with Jesus. All the things that lead to happiness, do those things and forget about being happy. If you'll do those things, you will be happy. Okay? Sinlessness is the same thing. You know, stop, don't worry about being sinless. Just do the things that lead to perfection, and the perfection will come. Because you will never know when you're perfect anyway. In fact, uh, let me share with you a little parable. Suppose that there is a race, and I join this foot race. Now, this foot race is not around an oval track. This foot race is down the road, up the hill, down the hill, around the curve, you know, and uh, various different roads and paths that I could take, and the foot race is all marked out. Uh, now this race has a race master, a man who's in charge of the race. He's designed the race. And so I come up to him before the race begins, and I say, sir, could you please tell me uh, what is the, when it, where is the end of the race? And he says, I'm not going to tell you that. And you say, well, how am I supposed to know when I reach the end of the race? And he says, you won't know it. You won't know when you reach the end of the race. But I will. Your job is to follow the signs that point to where the race track is. You'll reach the end of it. You won't know when you get there, but I will. Now that, brothers and sisters, I think is a good analogy of the perfection that we need after the close of probation. If we follow the signs that God has given us, the indications, the, 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 the things we need to be doing to develop a character, 
uh, that will, can stand during the seven last plagues, then we will never know when we have achieved that goal. But God will. And I propose to you that God is not going to close probation until every one of his people that is, that is longing to be with him and stand through the time of trouble, Jesus is not going to close probation until everyone is ready. If you need a little more time, he'll extend the probation for you. And I'm going to point out something else. There is coming what is called a latter rain that I believe will push our character development into fast forward. And what might have taken us several years before uh, the latter rain will be accomplished very much, much quicker after, during the latter rain. And so God will prepare his people for, for the close of probation, whatever perfection they need, he will prepare them for it uh, through the latter rain, as well as our own diligent effort right now. Uh, so in response to, will we have to be sinlessly perfect after the close of probation? Well, Ellen White gives some indication that that may be the case, and therefore I'm not going to deny it. I'm simply going to tell you that you'll never know when you are that good. And therefore, it is spiritually destructive for you to start to make all that effort and worry about how good you are and whether you're perfect or not. Let God take care of that. You just keep doing what he tells you to do from day to day, and he'll take care of getting you as good as he sees you need to be. You can relax. The only thing you don't want to relax about is following the signs, doing the things he's given you. But as far as worrying about being perfect, forget it. Relax, relax. He'll take care of that. That's his, that's his problem, not yours. Finally, one more story. One day I'm sitting in the, my front room watching the TV, and the news, the, the news anchor comes on, and he starts telling about a strange skin disease that is afflicting people all over the world. And he says, you know, the, CD, the, the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta is trying desperately to figure out what is the cause, you know, trying to figure out a cure for this skin disease. And then he says something very interesting. He says, the only people that are not being afflicted by this skin disease are those who are in rebellion against the one world government. Well, uh, that sounds to me, as I'm sitting there, like... Most of the world has this, and the ones that are in rebellion against the one world government are actually God's people. And they're the ones that don't have the skin disease. And I'm scratching my head and saying, that sounds like the first plague. Well, if the first plague has fallen, what does that mean? Probation is closed. Just then, there's a knock on my door. So I go open the door, and there's my friend Robert. I invite him in, we sit down, we start to chat, and pretty soon we turn to the news story about the skin disease. And uh, Robert says, Marvin, you know, that sounds an awful lot like the first plague to me, and I agree, it does. And then Robert says, you know what that means, don't you? I say, yeah, probation is closed. And then Robert says, Marvin, do you feel good enough, perfect enough for the close of probation? What do you think I'll say? Yeah, brother, bring it on. I'm ready. No, that's not what I would say. God's people will, Ellen White says God's people will still be searching their lives after the close of probation to see if there's anything, any, any sin, unconfessed, anything in their lives that is, that, uh, is not what God would want. We will not know, we will not feel or know after the close of probation like we're ready. But we will have learned to trust God and we will have learned to say, God, apparently probation is closed. I don't feel like I'm ready for it, but I'm going to trust you to carry me through. Ellen White makes a couple of statements that I think are helpful here. First, Selected Messages, Book 1, 177 and 178. It is not essential for you to know and tell others all the whys and wherefores as to what constitutes a new heart or as to the position we can and must reach so as to never sin. 
our ministers must cease to dwell upon their peculiar ideas with the feeling you must see this point as I do or you cannot be saved. And I say that with regard to, to the perfection, sinless perfection after the close of probation, that is not something we should make a major point of. And then from the same book, Selected Messages, book one, page 179, advice to a certain individual, you will take passages in the testimonies that speak of the close of probation, of the shaking among God's people, and you will talk of a coming out from this people of a purer, holy, holier people that will arise. And then she says, now all this pleases the enemy. So I think that this, this talk about how sinless we have to be after the close of probation uh, in order to live without a mediator is actually spiritually destructive. I advise you not to go there. Just do what you need to be doing each day today and let Jesus take care of whether or not you are ready for the close of probation. Father in heaven, thank you for the wonderful news that Jesus is coming soon. We know that there will be a close of probation before that time comes and we'll have to live in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Father, help us to relax about that and just be faithful in doing our part from day to day and let Jesus take care of when to close the probation because we can trust that he's not going to close probation until one of every one of his faithful people is ready. Thank you for that assurance. In Jesus' name, amen.